गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग आफ्ताब साहब वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे वी हैव आवर वेरी रिसोर्स पर्सन प्रोफेसर एस के सिंह साहब प्रोफेसर एस के सिंह साहब इज द प्रोफेसर ऑफ फिजिक्स इन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फिजिक्स अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी अलीगढ़ ही ज्वाइन डिपार्टमेंट एज ए लेक्चर एट अ वेरी अर्ली आई विल से वेरी यंग एज and he has a experience researcher in physics with a very good publications and guided good phd's he visited abroad many times for attending and delivering the keynote address and lecture in different various national international seminars and conferences as far as his administrative responsibilities are concerned participants he was a very successful vice chancellor of hemati nandan bagura garhwal university and during his tenure this university got the status of central university from state university and after getting this status of central university sir has done a very remarkable work as far as the uh, i will say the semester system is concerned evaluation system of a concern teaching learning concern and most important infrastructural developments uh, took place during uh, sir stanio he was the chairman of various committee of vcs of central universities and state universities and he was the member of icsr university grant commission and other academic bodies in india and abroad as far as his expertise is concerned he is an outreach versatile resource person of Uh, not only different university of different universities hrdc but it is hrdc of aligarh muslim university even after retirement he is very active and i will say the knowledgeable i will say his knowledge which is very motivating for us uh, basically i am not going to tell much more about sir because uh, he has a very detailed and long uh, cv but i will tell you i will, i told you do, those things which he has achieved in a very a uh, young age sir so this is this is just for our motivation uh, with these words sir i would like to invite you uh, to speak please speak on the topic which is given to you that interconnectivity of teaching and research sir now mic over to you sir uh, thank you aftab sir very much um, i welcome all the uh, participants to uh, this this presentation uh, i hope um, i am audible to all of you uh, there is if there is any problem please uh, let let me know and uh, we, we will fix that so in this presentation i will be talking about the interconnectivity of teaching and research uh, you know that uh, these days uh, research is an integral part of uh, all the teaching institutions um, especially universities central and state universities uh, as well as um, in most of the colleges especially those colleges which are, are in, engaged in uh, teaching post graduate classes classes uh, so uh, right now uh, the people who enter this profession either in the colleges or in the uh, universities uh, uh, it is supposed that they will be doing uh, almost uh, full time research uh, along with their teaching responsibilities uh in fact uh, most of you who have appeared for the interview for your jobs either in the in the committee appointed by the universities or by the committees appointed by the higher education commission in your state uh you must have faced the interviews and in the interviews you might have experienced 
uh, that the, the members of the board ask questions, uh, not only on your teaching, uh, but on research. Uh, in fact, most of the questions are on your research activities and probably very few questions, maybe sometimes no questions are asked about your teaching if you are beginning your career. Uh, so you see that uh, the search is now considered to be not only integral part of teaching a profession, but also uh, the more important part of the, the teaching institution, uh, teaching institutions. Um, but it was uh, not always so. Uh, the reason is uh, that as the higher education system evolved in our country, or um, surprisingly even in the, the Western countries, uh, the importance of research was realized um, in steps. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the universities, uh, uh, the form the, in which the university exists today uh, was not the form when the university system started 100 or 200 years back in Europe or in our own country. Um, you know that we have a great tradition of higher education, uh, of having great universities uh, almost a um, thousand years ago uh, in India. Uh, one of the intriguing question is, uh, was there the research an integral part of the universities in those days? Or the research was integral part of the university when the higher education system or the university system was started in, in Europe or um, in Arab countries or um, in, in, in countries in, in Greece or China or Japan, uh, was the research always integral part of teaching or uh, it was not so? Uh, so uh, even now we know that uh, most of the private universities, you might be familiar with some of them which are uh, running in your neighborhood. Um, maybe some of you are working in those uh, private universities, the good ones. Uh, but once they started, you know, there was no research component in private universities. They were mostly based on uh, uh, teaching activities. Uh, later, when uh, their recognition or their importance was realized, they also indulged in research activities. Uh, so you see, it is something that the gradual development. Uh, not only that, if you look at the new education policy uh, of 2020, you also find that there the universities or higher education institutions are, are classified in three categories. Uh, one purely teaching institutions, uh, teaching universities, the other is the research universities, and there are some teaching and research universities. Uh, so even now there are uh, some universities which are uh, uh, not engaged in uh, much of the church activities, but mainly involved in the in the teaching. Uh, like many of the colleges, but especially the undergraduate colleges. Uh, so I think I will uh, present my uh, my uh, uh, thoughts on uh, interconnectivity of teaching and research in in two parts. First part, I will give you some historical introduction. Uh, so that it can be put in the proper perspective. Uh, if you are um, young and joined the profession uh, recently, uh, I, I think it will be of uh, very interesting to you. Uh, but if you have been in the profession for five to ten years, uh, probably you, you must have come across uh, various studies uh, where the connection between teaching and research are discussed. You might have noticed that not much serious work has been done in studying pedagogically the relation between teaching and research. Why is that? I will have a few comments to, to make on that. Uh, but let me start with giving you a historical introduction of the relation between teaching and research in Indian universities. Uh, so let me say a few words about um, Western system. How was the Western system starting? 
fact, uh, these days you know about uh, the, the various ranking, international ranking uh, authorities. Uh, there are many of them. This, uh, this is not the topic, so I will not list them. Uh, where uh, universities are ranked uh, worldwide. And you see, top universities really come from the Western countries, some very few from China and Japan. Uh, and those universities, you know, like uh, MIT or Stanford or Oxford or Cambridge, uh, they are uh, probably known for teaching, but mostly they are known for research. In fact, I, I, I think the people in India uh, recognize those universities for their research activities. Recognize those universities for the number of Nobel laureates they have they have produced. Uh, we in India recognize those universities for the the, the research innovations they have uh, uh, indulged in the last uh, last fifty years or last hundred years. Uh, most of the advancements uh, made in uh, industries, uh, industrial development, uh, or in the in the in the business model, or in the medical science or in the physics, or in chemical sciences, biological sciences. We all know those universities because of uh, their research activities. Not much we know about their uh, teaching activity. And we assume that their, their teaching must be, must be good, very good. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not always so. In fact, we, the best institution in India are uh, supposed to be the IITs and IIMs. Uh, it is a well-known fact in IITs, uh, most of the research is done by research means after M.Tech, PhD, M.Tech and uh, PhD. Most of the research is done uh, by the engineering graduates who are not the graduate of IITs. In fact, they are graduates of other university, uh, engineering institutions and they join these IITs um, for their research purposes, for their M.Tech or for their PhDs. Uh, most of the students who are produced uh, by IITs, they probably leave the country and go to the United States and uh, probably do MBA and uh, uh, get uh, various other types of job other than engineering. And they, they are lost to the, the research field in whatever field they are working, either in sciences or applied sciences or engineering. So you see, most of the research is done in... Uh, uh, in in uh, IITs are the best science and um, uh, engineering institutions in the country are also by uh, are all by those graduates who are produced in, in not the best teaching institutions. So you see here a mismatch between teaching institutions. I mean IITs are supposed to be the best institution for producing BTEC. By that we mean that they are the best institution for teaching. They are best institutions for the research also, but the research is not done by those students which are taught by IIT. The research is done by those who are taught engineering in other institutions. So uh, to say that there is a connection between teaching and research uh, in that institution is, uh, is, is not correct in a sense. Uh, so these, these are sort of the anomalies when we, uh, when we grade, a, grade an institution. Uh, for example, I will give you my own example. When I went uh, visited for a NAG institution, so I will not know them. That was a government institution, uh, of course, doing um, undergraduate, postgraduate, and research. So what they had done was, since it was a government institution and teachers were government employees, so one year before they planned for NAG, in every subject they transferred the best teachers and researchers from all over the state to that institution. So, and when they prepared their report, I mean, the report was very excellent because everybody was very active in the search and they had produced PhD and they had produced papers of higher, high quality. But they were not produced in that institutions. One year before, they were all transferred from all other government institutions, put in that, that place. Uh, maybe if the NAC 
with its another government institution, most of them will be transferred to that institution, and um, the report of that institution will be will be excellent. So I was the chairman of the committee, and uh, we had a great dilemma because if we give the grade of A plus to that institution, so that is not correct because the work is not done being done in that institutions. The work is being done in the uh, by the by the people who, who were transferred one year or six months back to that institution, but the work was done earlier in uh, their parent institutions, earlier institutions. So uh, truly, that institution get the credit, not this institution. So you see, somehow um, this grading uh, based on research could be uh, very very uh, misleading. Uh, so. Uh, so let me come back to the, the sort of historical introduction. Uh, I, I'm just trying to, to project you the, the, uh, the interconnectivity between teaching and teaching and research as far as a particular institution is concerned. Because later on we will see uh, that one of the very important aspects of studying the relation between teaching and research is that it also depends upon the institution, apart from any other things. It also depends upon the, upon the institutions. Uh, so let me come to the historical part because this you may not be familiar, many of you may not be familiar with this. Uh, you see, when the university started in Western countries, there also the situation was very much like what we had uh, in early times. Probably uh, you are familiar, one of the institutions you know is very famous is either Oxford or Cambridge University. But the universities in Europe started long before that, started in Spain, started in Italy, started in France, especially Paris. And uh, I, I think the universities in England started after, started after that. Uh, you know Christianity was very a dominant factor in the, in the life of Europe. Uh, so all these institutions started teaching really religious studies. So uh, most of these universities were doing religious studies. Uh, what is more obvious to you, to you and to many of us is that in Arab countries, in Islamic countries also, the higher institutions, so-called the university, so-called madrasa, madrasa was really university, and not what we understand by madrasa today. Uh, they were also indulged mainly in the religious studies. Also to study those subjects which make you successful in your, your life, which means uh, life skills. You should know only the life, life skills because at that time uh, getting job was not sort of priority. So you, you have to uh, study the, the the how to survive in the society. So first important thing was uh, religious studies. Uh, then the next topics which were taken was jurisprudence, the law, because law was one of the important aspects of uh, social life uh, those days. So those universities started really with the uh, with the with the study of religion and law. Uh, we also know that in our Indian system also, uh, the oldest universities at um, Alanda and Takshila, uh, they uh, also started uh, with the uh, religious studies of the Vedas and other things, and uh, then the jurisprudence. Uh, but we had a tradition of uh, doing studies in uh, astronomy and mathematics and grammar and languages in those days. Uh, so uh, it, it was sort of gradually started, uh, but those cannot be classified as a research. Uh, in fact, in uh, Western countries, um, there was a person called um, there was a priest, really Neman, and he he so, said no, that no. Uh, university should do not only study religion and uh, jurisprudence. But this also study of uh, social sociology, how to survive in the society, and uh, since Christianity was very strict, uh, running away from religious studies was supposed to be very liberal, 
and uh, that is why these subjects in social science and the uh, our arts um, subjects they are called uh, uh, liberal subjects these are called liberal sciences so or liberal arts so this uh, nomenclature of uh, liberal arts came in existence uh, because of the studies which was diversified from the religious studies uh, but at that, that time there was no uh, there was no um, emphasis on, uh, on on research or creation of knowledge uh, it was the more emphasis was on learning uh, what was there around you and what would make you, you, you successful uh, like you know in our uh, gurukul system and when these uh, students went to the gurukul uh, they were uh, taught how to how to survive in society how to be good in your life things like yeah. that uh, not really creation of knowledge or uh, doing research so that was this sort of model of the universities um, in the west as well as in india of course i don't have much knowledge about what what was a system in china and japan because those those societies are as old as indian society uh, their universities are as old as our university so they must have some systems of higher education in china and in japan uh, but more or less that was the that was the system uh, in fact it was in the 18th century uh, a person called Humboldt who was in Germany and he sort of advocated that uh, research must be an integral part of a uh, university system because it is an intellectual activity and if uh, the best minds are put to uh, work on uh, new ideas uh, then society could be revolutionized so he was working in berlin so berlin university was one of the earliest one where research was made integral part of uh, um, teaching almost 300 years ago uh, in fact very soon it was realized in germany in fact germany of those days was really covering most of the europe other than spain and italy uh, most of part of the Austria or Poland or Czechoslovakia and others, they were part of German Empire at that time. So, if you, other than Italy and Spain, uh, most part was influenced by Germany. So, all the higher education system, the universities in those those areas, uh, realized very soon uh, the importance of having research in uh, universities. And they indulged in that. But that was the reason Germany dominated uh, the world in, in 300 years back. In fact, Germany was the major industrial uh, nation uh, before the World War, First World War, even up to the Second World War. That was the uh, most important uh, nation industrial by scientific development uh, was, was uh, Germany. That was because their education system integrated research with the teaching and uh, most of the innovations were done uh, done during uh, those those uh, universities which were either in germany or were opened on uh, uh, on the pattern of the the humboldt uh, university uh, in, in germany uh, not only that the the later part of uh, the universities which were um, started in the united states were also uh, based on the same same pattern because after all, uh, what what is the United States these days? In fact, those are the people who really migrated from Europe. Most of the people have who have gone to uh, who have uh, settled in in United States are from either from Europe or England. So all this university system, uh, which was started by Humboldt uh, on Humboldt's idea, not by him, but based on his idea that research should be an integral part of that. Uh, uh, was uh, adopted in the whole of Europe and the uh, United States. And that is the reason even today, the West dominates in the innovation and in the, in the new ideas and uh, new, new discoveries. Uh, so that was a system prevalent there.
uh, in India, as, as I said, that uh, higher education system has gone uh, gone uh, uh, major changes because, as I said, we already had this uh, Gurkhal system, uh, which was uh, not so bad, not so good either, uh, because we did create some things in in the field of astronomy and mathematics at that time. Uh, but uh, soon after that, it was invaded by uh, by uh, by Muslims invaders, and the uh, Islamic system of education was imposed on on on, on uh, Indian higher education system. Uh, in in fact, the Islamic system of higher education was uh, uh, not as bad as you can think, uh, because Arab universities or uh, universities in the Arab countries were also known for their work in astronomy, mathematics. Uh, they were doing good work, uh, but research was not an integral part of it. They had invented many, many things, but uh, not as a uh, policy of research, uh, but uh, as an individual, individual effort. Uh, to give you an example, I mean, uh, in, in, in um, even in the Western countries, Galileo was uh, hanged back for doing for doing research because it uh, it, it contradicted with the with the thoughts in the Christianity. Uh, so uh, research was not an integral part of it, either in the Western system or in the Western system. In India, we were unfortunate because uh, soon after. Um, our older university system was destroyed by uh, Islamic invaders, and they were trying to impose Islamic uh, system of education. In fact, they did impose Islamic system of education uh, for many, many hundred years. Uh, this was Arabic and Persian, and these were the really part of it. But uh, either deliberately or they could not do, they were not able to destroy our own, own system. So for many hundred years, uh, we had uh, both systems coexisting: the the the, the ancient Indian system, um, as well as the, the Islamic education system. Uh, the system underwent major changes when the East India Company came, or the British came, and uh, in 1857, the British started three universities. Uh, that is in uh, Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta. They were the first universities established by by so-called government by East India Company. You know that very soon after 1857 uh, mutiny or in war of independence, uh, East India Company was taken over by the the, the 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 Queen, by the British government. So after that, the, what we call the British Raj. But before 1857, uh, it was really East India Company. East India Company um, under under British um, uh, governance uh, started these university system. Uh, at that time, you know, Oxford and uh, Cambridge and other other universities in uh, in Britain were very well established, and they were built on the Humboldt model. So, if the British were sincere, they could have started uh, Calcutta and Bombay and uh, Madras University on the on the on the uh, pattern of uh, Oxford and Cambridge. But they did not. They did not because their aim was not to create knowledge. Their aim was not excellence. But their aim was to 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 produce babus who could run the East India Company or who could run the British Raj for the for the Britain, and 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 produce the Indians who would help them in running the running the British Raj. So their aim was not uh, creation of knowledge or creation of excellence in higher education. But to creation of clerks and babus, uh, so obviously uh, that did not uh, require any research. So they they opened uh, many many colleges um, uh, in the country other than these uh, these universities, uh, but there was no component of research. Uh, so research did not exist even in the early days when the Indian universities were started by by British. Uh, for the obvious reasons, uh, and uh, of course, that does not mean that there was no research, because you know research is a create, 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 
creativity activity creative activity ascribed to the human mind so whenever the human mind is at work they will create something so research was always there uh, as a, as a result of um, creative minds of intelligent people and there were many in the indian society so research was done on completely volunteer basis not as a policy of the government or not policy of the higher education institution uh, whether they may be a college or a university but they were done on the voluntary voluntary basis uh, what happened after the independence uh, to give you an example in in uh, there is a statistics around 8 1890 or so uh, in north india in, in in the vicinity of what is now up punjab and pakistan uh, there were 85 colleges opened by uh, various people including the british british uh, raj uh, and there was only one science college in those 85 colleges in 85 colleges which were open uh, in the area around delhi and lahore uh, in that part so you can see that their aim was not uh, teach uh, science or engineering or uh, anything like that um, but uh, just to 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 have very basic knowledge uh, so that uh, some educated persons can be created who will be who will be bridge between the indian people and the british rulers so that is why deliberately no research was started but what was the situation after independence? After independence, really, uh, the priority of the government of India was, was different because the, the literacy rate was very low. Um, there were not many colleges. Uh, so the, the, the aim was to, uh, to make uh, India literate, to do lot of, uh, uh, to open a lot of colleges so that uh, not only higher education, but even the primary education and secondary education uh, could be brought to everybody, to every people, what we call um, accessibility and equity uh, to, to in, in education. Forget about higher education. So their aim was to bring as many people as possible to the education system to educate them so obviously the emphasis was on primary education and secondary education and of course someone on the on, on the on the university education also so even though though they were very keen uh, uh, that research should be an integral part of uh, uh, higher education system but priority was different priority was uh, to give uh, opportunity to the deprived sections of the society, uh, privileged section, uh, section of society was very few, maybe 20 percent, 80 percent were people who are, uh, access, they were uh, higher education, our education was not um, accessible to them. So that was the aim. Uh, so that was the sort of research was kept, uh, sort of a secondary aim in the, the education system uh, in fact thanks to the our first uh, prime minister uh, pandit nehru he was a very science oriented person and he realized that uh, not only education but the industrial development was also important for for the nation to survive and to progress so he opened a lot of uh, research institutions purely research institutions uh, as you as you know uh, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research was uh, one of the first ones which were started. Uh, in fact, Indian uh, Agricultural Research Institute, Indian Council of Medical Research Institute. In fact, they were started by the British period. Um, but more incentives were given, given to that. Uh, and the research was supported in a big way in, in, in these, these research institutes. So research did pick up after independence, but there was a bad news as well. The bad news was that uh, more money was put in the research in these institutions 
where there was no teaching. You know, these institutions where our CSIR labs, our ICMR lab, or um, PUSA Institute, for example, IC Agriculture Institute, those labs, they were purely research labs. And since the research was supposed to be encouraged, more money was put there. So the some people who were doing research in the universities, they also moved to these research institutions uh, because, they, because of the teaching load, they were not able to find enough time. Uh, the, the universities and colleges were in bad shape. More money was going to the research. So these people who were working in the university also moved to the research institutions. So we had uh, two compartments. One compartment was universities and colleges, where there was mostly teaching, very little research. And then one compartment was the research institutions, where there were only research, almost no teaching. So there was no connectivity between teaching and research uh, in, in, in this situation. Uh, and research suffered in the universities and colleges. As I said, the people who were doing uh, good work or who were uh, dedicated to research also moved to research institutions because they could, they could get more money, they could get more time to do research, so they moved. Uh, so this interconnectivity between teaching and research was almost uh, minimal. As I said, you know, one place where there was only only, only only teaching, mainly teaching, very little research. It was one place where there was only research around Muslim teaching. So, so no, no relationship. Of course, nothing is absolute. So, still there was some very little research being done in universities and colleges, but obviously no teaching in the new, new institutions. Uh, of course, there were some institutions like IITs, which were started in 1950s. Uh, and some other institutions uh, where uh, some research as well as teaching was, was being done. Uh, in fact, um, whatever research was done, even in those days, was on the voluntary level. Because as you know, uh, if you are uh, working in science subjects or applied science subjects, the C.P. Raman, who, who, who is the only uh, Indian scientist who got Nobel Prize while working in India, there are other Indians who have got Nobel Prize, but they have all been working in either England or United States. So he, he worked in a place called uh, Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, which was not a government institute. It was an institution started by um, some private organization. So uh, that sort of, in a sense, uh, no, no contribution of uh, government in that, in that, in that sense. Uh, so that was the reason that uh, there was no uh, Relation, no connection between research and teaching, uh, which was encouraged by the, the by the government. And uh, of course, these days, uh, while looking at the research point of view, we can say that that was a bad aspect of the government policy. Uh, but uh, looking from the the country's point of view, it was not so bad because uh, I, I mean, if 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 uh, we had uh, indulged in the in the higher education system, I was possible as was prevalent in Western countries, uh, probably the, the more educated, the educated people would have become more educated uh, and the people who are less educated probably would be uh, uh, more, more than a, more than 80 percent. So the government policy of uh, bringing everybody together or to bring as much uh, part of the population in the education system, in the higher education system as possible, uh, is, a, is a good policy. In fact, there is a policy even uh, prevalent uh, prevalent today. Uh, most of the IITs, most of the universities, central universities are being opened in the in the remote areas. Those areas where uh, there is not much uh, um, activity in the higher education and the research institution, uh, with the aim that those areas could be brought uh, into the mainstream. The people in those areas could be uh, provided opportunities for uh, education as well as for higher, for higher education. Uh, so, um, but obviously, uh, research has was not to be forgotten, and uh, then many many institutions like uh, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Biotechnology, uh, Defense Research um, and Development Organization, ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, strengthening of uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, all those things steps were taken 
um, again, but uh, those are the the research institutions where no teaching is no teaching is done. Uh, of course, the teaching and research is uh, either um, central universities, some state universities, IITs, um, IIMs. Recently opened uh, II ICERs where science and engineering research institutions, science and research education institutions are there. So now there are uh, some. Uh, institutions where teaching and research is being, being encouraged. Uh, so that is the history of how um, of how research and teaching are interconnected, uh, and how this relationship has developed in the last 200, 200 years, especially with reference to the Indian higher education system. With reference to the Indian uh, universities and uh, research institutions, uh, so we, as uh, as I said, you can see in the new education policy, uh, we already have a higher education institutions classified as teaching institutions, research institutions, and teaching institutions where teaching and research is is, is being done both ways. So to to ask a general question. What is the relation between teaching and uh, research uh, in Indian context is it's not easy. So then you have to identify whether you are trying to answer this question in the context of teaching universities, where very little research is being done, or you are asking in, the, in connection with the higher education institutions, we are doing research where very teaching is done, or you are asking about the uh, in the context of the higher education institutions where teaching and research both is being done, where you can find a good, good connection. So you see, it's a difficult question to answer because it depends uh, very much on the, on the teaching. Uh, but apart from these practical considerations, uh, since you are all uh, have thinking mind, uh, what should be the relationship? That necessarily need not be true. But uh, as a thinker, what do you think the relationship should be? Um, with what type of relation should, relationship should exist between teaching and research? Let me try to answer this question. <clears throat> Let me try to answer this question with a, with a rider. With a rider that it is a very difficult question to answer. I will give you the reasons. Or to justify the answers. I have been engaged in teaching and research both for the last 50 years. So I will have obviously a bias in my thinking. Uh, but let me give you the reason for my bias. The reason is that teaching and research both are intellectual activity of highest order. Research consists of three parts, creation of knowledge and then transmission of this knowledge to students or to whosoever is interested and third application of this knowledge which leads to innovation and um, other uh, things which are useful for society. While teaching concentrates on one aspect, that communicating the existing knowledge to the students in ways which is most effective as well as to motivate students to create knowledge and apply that knowledge. So you see, both activities 
our intellectual activities are related at a higher level. Both are very creative academic activities. So they should be related somehow. And they should be related in a positive sense. That if a person by training learns how to create knowledge, how to disseminate knowledge to others, after all, research scientists are useless if they are not able to communicate their results, communicate their creation to other scientists, to disseminate the knowledge which they have created to other people. Nobody would know what they have done, what they have created. So they should not only create, but they also be able to effectively communicate, disseminate knowledge to others. Who are also researchers. That may be easy or difficult depending upon the subject or depending upon the person. But to communicate the knowledge which not only you have created, but to communicate or disseminate the knowledge which everybody in the whole world has created to the students who know nothing. They are starting from zero. So it is a more difficult job. You can realize that. It's communicating, disseminating knowledge which you have created, because you are a master of it, to researchers who already have attained certain status of knowledge would be easier, because you know the subject, person you are trying to communicate also know the subject, so it's easy. But to communicate and disseminate the knowledge which everybody in the whole world is created to the students who are starting from zero is order of magnitude difficult problem. But it will help. So if you are a very active researcher, you know how to communicate, you know how to disseminate, and that you can use in your teaching. So, at intellectual level, you think that a good researcher should be a good teacher also, because he knows how to how, how to communicate uh, to the people uh, who know less than what they know. So they should be a, a good teacher. That's why I'm saying that if you are a thinker, uh, and if you are a creative, you have a creative mind. You will think that uh, the relationship between teaching and research should be positive. The correlation should be positive, talk in the statistical terms, uh, and it should be non zero and positive. That's what we think. Similarly, the teaching should also have a positive effect on research because if you are uh, teaching in a class of 50 students or 20 students or 60 students, then your communication skill will be better. You need a better communication skill because out of 50 students, class of 50 students in an undergraduate class or for a class of 20 students in a postgraduate class, there will be students at various intellectual level. And then you should know how to communicate to a class of people who will be the varying intellectual uh, competence. Right? Communicate to research scientists is easier because they have already above certain threshold, they know things and can communicate. Uh, but to, to communicate to a class of uh, undergraduates where you have 50 or 100 students where uh, intellectual capability to understand new ideas may vary from uh, the scale from 50 to 100 is, is not easy, it's very difficult. Uh, so, if you are able to teach such a such a such a diversity of uh, students, then you should be able to uh, communicate your research better uh, to a more more homogeneous homogeneous group. So, uh, teaching should really improve your communication skills. So that's what way the teaching has a positive effect on your on your research. Not only that, if you are teaching a postgraduate class then you can really fortify your 
future students. If you're a class of 25 students, you know which you are the best one, who, who are motivated for research, who have aptitude for research. Not all of them will have aptitude for research, but some of them will have the aptitude of research. So you can um, uh, you, you can pick up your future future students, your future research students from that class, uh, who have really the good at, aptitude for doing research, so that your research output will be better. So, uh, being a teacher would help in your research. So that should also be a positive correlation, non-zero and positive correlation um, between teaching and research. So as I said, both are uh, both are um, intellectual activities of higher order, and they are related at some some level. Uh, I have also demonstrated why uh, we think that uh, research uh, should influence teaching in a positive way. Uh, the teaching should help research in a positive way so there's the core, there should be there should exist a correlation um, which should be non zero which should be positive maybe small or large that is difficult to decide as i will point out in a moment why it is difficult to decide uh, but main thinking is that they should be related the relation should be positive if you talk in terms of statistics and mathematics, that correlation should be non-zero and uh, positive things, not negative. But that is what we think. What is the situation on the ground level? Has there been any research in this? Has this question whether good researchers are good teachers, or good teachers are good researchers, has been answered based on the real pedagogical research? either in India or in America or in England or in Japan or in China or in Australia or in New Zealand uh, the, the, or in the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, where higher education is uh, at a very, very, very sophisticated level. Teaching is of highest class at Oxford and Cambridge. Had this research been done? The answer is yes and no. Research has been done in all these countries, I think, except in India. Not much work, to my knowledge, has been done. And uh, when I was first asked to give this lecture uh, in this in this series of uh, meetings, uh, I found it very fascinating that not much work has been done in the direction. Uh, and the person who is coordinating these activities does belong to the education department. They are concerned with the pedagogy. And I insisted that they should take up this work in the Indian context. Uh, but let me come back to that uh, result when uh, where uh, this research has been done. This is uh, mostly being done in the United States and United Kingdom for obvious reasons. The reason for this research being done in the United States also United Kingdom, maybe in other countries like Australia and New Zealand, is that if this correlation becomes comes out to be positive and negative, then that will be a boost to the research. Because the number of researchers who are engaged in, in any society is a lot less than number of uh, teachers who are involved involved in, uh, uh, in, in in teaching profession at undergraduate or postgraduate level in any in society, either in India or United States or United Kingdom, because there are so many universities, so many colleges, so many students, so many teachers. Uh, as compared to those, the number of research institutions and number of research being done the universities and colleges uh, is not that high. Uh, so, uh, if we can find a positive relation between research and teaching, then that will be an added incentive for teachers in the universities and colleges to be supported for research officially by, by those governments. So that was the reason which was uh, uh, research was taken up uh, in, 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 these, in these countries. 
But the, those researchers realized very soon how difficult it is uh, to do this research. Why it is very difficult? The reason it is very difficult is how do you define a good teacher? What are the parameters which define a good teacher? You know, in order to do a scientific uh, research, you should have a research methodology, right? So you must decide what are the parameters which define a good teacher, what are the parameters which define a good searcher. Then you grade teachers on those parameters, different parameters, and you grade researchers on those different parameters, and then you compare the grades. That is how you can find uh, whether there is a correlation between this or not, and correlation is positive or negative, is small or large. So first we have defined the, the parameters on which to judge. What are the parameters which define a good teacher? You are a teacher, so you, you ask this question yourself. What are the parameters define a good teacher? Is the result of the examination which decides a good teacher? I am sure a lot of people say yes, that is a good criteria. Anybody who gives good results will be a good teacher. But there will be also who will disagree with that. Because good examination result can be obtained by a, by, by a teacher who is not very good. I don't say bad teacher, but who is not very good. Why? Very simple to answer. A teacher who is not very good, is not very sincere, can set up a very, very easy paper. Mark could be good. A teacher who is not very good in the class can be very lenient in marking. So result would be good. So to have a good result does not imply that teacher is good. Right? So you can argue both ways. A good teacher is, is very strict. Well, you can say if a good teacher is very popular, is he a good teacher? A lot of people say. Yes, teacher is very popular. All students like him. He's a very good teacher. Okay. But a good teacher, by definition, would also be very strict. Strict in the ten students attending the class, coming on time, listening to the lectures very carefully, not creating problem or trouble while in the class. So by nature, a good teacher would probably be very strict. That was not make that would not make him popular. So again, you can say a teacher who is popular among the students. Some people can say he's a good teacher, but equally, a number of people will say that he's not a good teacher because you know, he's very strict. He's very good. He doesn't um, allow you to enter the class even if you are five two minutes late. Uh, he turns you out. So. So if he's a, he, what is the criterion for good teacher? Obviously, examination is not foolproof. Being good nature is not foolproof. Uh, similarly, about the research, is the person who produces number of papers the good researcher? Again, some people will agree, some people will not agree. Because they, 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 they are not a lot of fake journals. You can pay money and get published. Even if you can publish books by paying some publishers. Other people do that. We have fought many people. We have seen many people in the interviews that they know nothing about the books which they have written. While asking in the interview questions, we, we realize that. So again, uh, uh, having uh, more number of papers is no guarantee that he's a good researcher. Again, publishing good quality of papers make a good researcher. I'm not sure because who decides the quality of paper? 
who decide the quality of journals in which you publish obviously there are some journals which are uh, acknowledged to be the best in the world but there are very few there are good there are some journals who are acknowledged to be worse fake but majority of journals are in between so who decides that depends upon whom you are asking so that is a personal question to decide the quality of the paper one of the very obvious example which you are all familiar or you should be familiar is the university grants commission has prepared a list of journals where if you publish your work will be recognized you see will not recognize your work if you publish in journals other than those list given by the university grants commission but a lot of people think that um, many of the journals in the uc list are useless so that also depends upon who, uh, who which committee has made those list which committee subject wise has made those list so that's again a personal personal question uh, decision so again i said the criteria what is the criterion for deciding a uh what is the parameters for deciding a, a good researcher so it's not a fixed parameter do you decide a person who gets um, awards from the government research awards he's a good researcher well some people say yes he has got this award he has got that award he has got that award so he's a very good researcher but we all know how rewards are given especially by government or by societies how the awards are given of course merit is one criterion but there is not the only criteria there are many other criteria which decide the uh, the award uh, of research in a given given subject so again that is not a full proof so for every parameter which you can de devise uh, it's not a full proof there you will find people for it and people against that is the nature of this research that is the nature of the teaching one of the saddest things I, I i i find and i have tried to uh, convince many but obviously with no success that even recruiting people for teaching profession yeah. no questions are asked about your teaching abilities <coughs> while appointing teachers in the university and colleges you ask mostly questions on research you will don't know the person who are going to appoint is able to communicate his ideas or not in fact in one selection committee i fought uh, against a candidate who was stammering you know he could not speak well he is stammering in the speech but some of the experts said no he is very good his research work is very good and he should be appointed of course i had another other opinion but he should be appointed as a research scientist in a research institution if he is not able to talk well if he is stammering how would you be able to communicate uh, in the class how would be able to conduct a lecture of one hour but again i mean uh, people uh, think no his research is good so he, he should he should be appointed so you see uh, there is no fixed criteria so if you don't have well defined parameters for defining a good teacher we don't have parameters for defining a good researcher how do you mark them how do you compare them right so it is a very difficult uh, question uh, but i said in the beginning uh, intellectually i think we, most of you will agree that the, the research the, the interconnectivity with the research and teaching should be positive should be uh, there should be a correlation and it should be positive. But I said, try to convince you that it's not an easy question to answer. It is not an easy project to research on, but that does not mean that there should be no research. There would be some, should be some research, and there have been some research in this, in this direction, as I said, in the uh, United States, United Kingdom, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, also in, uh, in, in Denmark. Copenhagen great school of thought in physics physical sciences uh, Sweden uh, 
but obviously the 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 result is not very encouraging as you might guess from what i have already elaborated that uh, some research said there is a positive correlation but small some researchers said it is a negative correlation that a good researcher is not a good teacher i will come to that in a moment and some people said there is no no correlation there is no correlation that uh, Oops, I think I'm sorry, I, what happened? Yes, sir? I, I think there's something wrong. Let me try again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. So we are back. All right. So uh, all three uh, results have been obtained by, by the researchers, but uh, not very good statistics. But what is important, uh, uh, what is important result which we learn from these researchers is that this question depends upon the discipline. That is, if you are asking uh, about the disciplines of humanities, then the result is different from the question you will get in sciences and engineering, sciences and applied sciences and engineering. This correlation, the nature of correlation is different. The nature of correlation is different whether you are asking for undergraduate classes or postgraduate classes. As you can see, you can guess the relation, the result in the postgraduate classes would be expected to be positive. Because students in postgraduate colleges classes are familiar with the research aspects of a teacher but students in your undergraduate classes are not familiar with the research activities of the teacher which is teaching them so if you take sample from students in the undergraduate classes obviously you will find probably null result because they have no idea about research activity. So how can they answer the question between uh, research and uh, teaching of, uh, uh, of the teacher concern? They know only the teaching aspect of the, the, the person. They, have, they, they don't know about the research aspect of the, the, of the, that the teacher is teaching them. So probably the, there will be null result. Probably the, the, they will answer negatively, no, no correlation between that. So I would urge all of you that if you are teaching undergraduate students, talk with them in groups what you are doing so that they know that if you are doing any research, what is it? If you are not doing any research, they should also tell them. Obviously, the answer to the question, what is relation between teaching and research, also depends upon uh, As I said in the beginning, upon the institution. Because some institutions are very, very liberal in supporting research. So they will encourage research. But some institutions are not very liberal in supporting the research, either financially or academically or discipline wise. For example, a person is active in research, he wants to attend a conference, he wants to research a paper, 
they will not give money for attending the conference they will not give leave for attending the conference they will insist that you teach your classes you finish your courses forget about attending the conference or presenting your paper things so and so forth so obviously it is it is, it is discouraging in that in that case the the, the result will be different uh, as compared to the case where um, uh, the institution is very 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 supportive so there are certain parameters the question is not absolute it all depends upon uh, first what is the discipline, whether it is humanities or social sci humanities, social sciences, or engineering and 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 and, 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 and sciences, or medicine, for example, or um, it will depend upon the institutions. Uh, it will depend upon the whether you are talking uh, your, your your sample size is from undergraduate students or sample size is from the postgraduate students. Uh, so, uh, these are difficulties in conducting a research um, on the subject, and that is why it is reflected in the in the in three types of results which has been obtained in various studies which has been done in United States and United Kingdom and Australia. Uh, one of the bad things about the research is the sample sizes has been very small uh, because. Uh, what are the samples? Samples really you ask either the students or you ask uh, the, the, the teachers themselves, but that is very subjective. Or you ask the administrators from the um, institutions. Again, their sample size is very, very small. Or you ask the, the question about the funding agencies. Obviously, funding agencies, uh, that sample is really lopsided because they know only about the research aspect of your um uh, personnel teachers or scientists uh, they are not really aware of the teaching aspects of the, the person concerned so the, these are hazards of uh, of doing a pedagogical research in this subject of doing uh, investigating the uh, relationship between the uh or correlation between the the teaching and research uh, it does not mean that no research should be done uh, despite all this, uh, the research should be done. Again, as I said, uh, the situation uh, in our countries is quite different compared to the Western countries. So we should not rely on the results obtained in the um, uh, United States or Iraqan Kingdom, but they could be a guide to, to, to how, how, how do we proceed. Uh, so um, I, I think it is a very good subject for the people in the education department to take up uh, this this research. And uh, as I said, uh, my own thinking, my own feeling, my own experience is that uh, uh, a good teacher, good researcher makes a, makes a good teacher. So therefore, the correlation should be uh, positive, should be positive. Uh, but as I said, this is a, is a thinking. It has to be supported by actual research on the, on the, the ground uh, by the taking uh, sufficient um, or uh, uh, sample of the of the students. As I told you that uh, the problem with the because the student samples are the real ones where you will get a result which could be reliable. But the problem with the student sample is that um, most of your students, most of our students are not familiar our, with our research activities. So as I said, uh, if you're working in a university or working in a postgraduate college, uh, you talk with your students um, uh, in a more informal way. If you're working in sciences, applied sciences, and engineering, take these students to your, uh, to your laboratory, explain them what you are doing, explain them what your students are doing, get them motivated uh, towards uh, higher education, towards research. Um, that way, there's this research uh, in, in, in understanding the connectivity between teaching and research uh, could be fruitful. Otherwise, um, your data could be very, very misleading. Uh, obviously, uh, problem lies really when your sample size consists of the undergraduate students. Because undergraduate students' population sample size can get very large because there are a large number of students. But as I said, again, those students are not familiar with your research activities because most of us do not engage 
uh, our undergraduate students in talking about our research for various reasons. Uh, so this, the subject is um, difficult to investigate, but the work uh, must be done. And I think I would suggest that um, as a curiosity, you should do a little project in your institution, in your college, in your uh, university. Uh, if you are in education department, department probably it, it, it is very good for you to do that. But you can also do in if you are in another department and really see um, that what is the correlation in your institution, in your department, if you are working in the university between teaching and research. All the good researchers are also good teachers, and good researchers are not good teachers. Uh, that will be very interesting to, to, to compile uh, such uh, research results in, in various departments and uh, the, the publish them. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in Indian situation, uh, as I said, uh, uh, our experience has been uh, that uh, I mean, my experience has been and probably experience of uh, my my uh, friends who have been active in research and teaching work that the uh, relationship between the research and teaching is uh, is uh, positive uh, uh, correlation is positive and small it is not very 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 large uh, but in some institutions, the, the this this has found to be negative also, uh, in a sense that uh, a good researcher gets more money, he gets more busy with the research, he finds less time to teach his own classes, so he doesn't teach his classes. Either his students teach the classes, or he skips the classes altogether. So his teaching suffers. Uh, moreover, if he is so good that he gets many awards, uh, then then he. he because of these awards, he, he goes on uh, talking about his research in many other institutions. He's absent from his own university, from his own institution, and neglects his teaching. Uh, that way, a very good researcher becomes a very bad teacher because he doesn't take his classes. So there, the, the result uh, is sort of negative. The correlation correlation is, uh, but as I said, uh, by far the correlation. Uh, has been has been positive, and that reflection the 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 results of the research which has been done in the the United States, especially United States and United Kingdom, uh, that in some class of institutions, some class of disciplines, you find the correlation is positive but small, but in another class of institutions and other other class of disciplines, uh, you 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 find that uh, correlation is is negative, so. Both types of results are, uh, are there. Uh, but with this presentation, I think I have uh, tried to explain to you that it is a subject which is worth investigating. And uh, that probably has um, <clears throat> discouraged many funding agencies, especially in the United States, uh, to, to fund uh, research in the, in, in the universities and colleges. And in fact, the committee, um, I, I have named committee led by some, some scientists has given um, made 50 recommendations that should be followed by <coughs> by researchers in their in their career uh, so that uh, this situation could be um, uh, <coughs> made the uh, correlation could be made positive and uh, those 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 recommendations have been forwarded to the various funding agencies in the United States. But of course, I have no records that the, the the monitoring of those conditions, those recommendations, has been done or not. I ha I have no 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 results on that, and I, I tried to look for uh, that. The funding agencies have um, made them mandatory those recommendations for the researchers who get funding from those. Uh, how to to uh, monitor their uh, research funds so that uh, they can help uh, in teaching and improve their in their own teaching and the teaching of their colleagues. Uh, so I, I think with this I'll, I'll stop my uh, my presentation.
probably have already uh, spent uh, time. Yes, I spent time, and I I think we have five to ten minutes for uh, for questions. If you have any any questions uh, on any any discussions, uh, I'll be very uh, glad to answer your uh, queries and, and questions. Um, thank you, thank you very much for for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, this deliberation. Uh, participants now. The time is for you to ask if you have any doubts, any query or questions. Sir is here with us for next five to ten minutes. Uh, you can ask any question if you have. Please, participants. We do, sir. Okay. If you have no questions, uh, maybe we. I we think so, sir. I think, sir, your topic interconnectivity and teaching and research is, uh, as you discussed, very much clear for the participants as well as for me also. So <laughs> I think sir, there is no more question from the participants. Uh, we have another session at 5:30, so the participants will join on that next link. Uh, once again, sir, on the behalf of HRDC and you, I would like to thanks to for today's uh, learned speaker, Professor S K Singh sir. Who is the former vice chancellor of uh, HNV University, Garhwal? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.